take too much of your time. All right. So we would first like to congratulate everyone on the arrival of the blessed month of Rajab. There are many birthdays such as Imam Ali, uh, salam, Imam Jawad, Imam al-Baqir. Inshallah, we can all use this time to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our Ahlul Bayt. Today's topic was inspired by actually a parapsychology course that I'm currently taking, where we talk about energy, telekinesis, and animal consciousness, just to add a few examples. And after much conversation with some brothers and sisters, we realized it would be very beneficial to have Sayyid al-Qazwini give us the Islamic perspective on some of these topics. So without further ado, the virtual stage is yours, Sayyid. Thank you. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Respected brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I also congratulate you all on the arrival of the month of Rajab. This blessed month, which is the month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have many beautiful occasions on this month, such as the birth of Imam al Baqir, which was Thursday, the birth of Imam al Hadi, which was yesterday. And in about a week, we will also be celebrating the birth of Imam al Jawad and the birth of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. So it is indeed a very Blessed month, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inspire our hearts with the wisdom of Ahlul Bayt in this blessed month and to grant us their shafa'ah. So one of the very interesting topics that were suggested to us to discuss is the Islamic perspective on paranormal activity. And, you know, specifically dimensions like telekinesis, spirits, jinns, angels, that unseen dimension, the types of energy that exist around us. Is there any reality to any of this? And what is the Islamic take on that? My dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world with many, many dimensions. One dimension is this physical, tangible dimension. This is the dimension that you can observe in the lab, right? You can take physical objects to the lab, inspect them under the microscope, and you can see how they're composed. This is only one dimension that Allah has created. There are some people like atheists, materialists, who believe that this is all that, that's out there in the universe. You only have the physical dimension. You don't have any other dimension. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created many other dimensions as well. It's not only the physical dimension. In fact, the physical dimension is the weakest of all dimensions, the most limited of all dimensions. We also have the spiritual dimension. We human beings, we are composed of a body and a soul. We have a spirit. We have a soul, ruh. And that is really what defines our existence. Now, some atheists, you know, they completely reject that. They will tell you that, no, there is no soul. There is no evidence for that. But we know that we do have a soul. I will just give you two quick examples to know that you are a spiritual being, that you do have a soul. One example is what we call the constant me. So let's say you're 30 years old now, 40 years old. When you say, 15 years ago, I went to school, I completed this activity, this happened to me, who is that me that you're referring to? It cannot be this physical body, because after 20 years, the physical body changed. Physically, you're a completely new being. Almost all cells in your body have regenerated into new cells. You're not the same physical being. But you still say, I did that 20 years ago. Who's that I? These cells, they changed. This skin, it changed. 
this flesh, it changed. <laughs> the flesh that you have now is not the same that existed 20 years ago. Every cell in it has been replaced. This is what science has uncovered for us. But you still say, I did that. Who's that I? That I is an indicator. There's a constant in you. That constant is your soul. You're still the same person. And everyone agrees you're the same person. It's the same entity, that same I, that same me. That is the soul. This is a beautiful reminder that we have that spiritual dimension. We have a soul in addition to our bodies. Another example is when you think about abstract ideas. Or suddenly you feel like you get it. Somebody is explaining something to you. Initially, you're struggling to understand it. Then you suddenly get it. Oh, now I get it. Or when you have feelings. Where is the source of that feeling that's feeling the feeling, right? Is it your physical body? No. The physical body does not have the capacity to feel and understand. What? The neurons are feeling pain? The, neur the neurons get that abstract idea? When someone's explaining something to you like, wow, now I get it. See that feeling of I get it. Who's getting it? Cells? What do cells know? Neurons, what do they know about abstract ideas? Look at each individual neuron. What does it know? We know we have a soul. It's the soul that understands abstract ideas. It's the soul that gets it. It's the soul that actually even feels pain. See, under the microscope, you can't see pain. Where's the pain? Yeah, you can see the effects of pain under the microscope. When you feel pain, your body produces certain hormones, let's say. The, the brain produces certain hormones. Okay, that's just the effect of, of, of the you know, feelings that you have. That's just the effect of the pain. But where is the exact pain? That is experienced by the soul. So we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the human being with another dimension. But little do we know about that dimension. The average human being has no clue about this dimension because the average being, human being spends his entire lifetime only stuck on the physical dimension, on the material dimension, dimension. But there's a metaphysical dimension. And one of the most beautiful spiritual metaphysical creations of Allah is angels. I invite all of you to explore the world of angel, angels, my dear brothers and sisters. One hadith states, Nothing has Allah created more than angels, even more than atoms, even more than cells, even more than the grains of sand on earth. Allah has created angels in the trillions and trillions. I can't even put a number to it. Angels are spiritual beings filled with the light of Allah and the energy of Allah. Angels are created from light. And they travel through wings. Not like those cartoon drawings that you see. Wings are just an ability that Allah has given to angels to move around the universe between the seven heavens. And these wings allow them to travel faster than the speed of light. And the more wings angels have, the faster they can travel the more capacity they have to move around um, the universe and have powerful locomotion. One, one, one hadith states, Jibra'il has 600 wings. And that's why, you know, within seconds, he comes from the highest heaven down to earth. Angels are these pure creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, some angels are very big in their size. They're created from light. But they occupy a huge space, a huge presence. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam in Nahj al he says there are some angels, their feet is on earth, their shoulders are under the throne of Allah, meaning they span the entire universe, billions of light years across, that's how big they are. Allahu Akbar. What has Allah created out there? And once the Prophet said that twice in my life, I saw the actual image of Jibra'il. He filled the whole horizon and the universe from east to west. If you were able to see the observable universe, 
you'd see Jibrail across the entire universe. And then some angels are very small. Some hadith states there are some angels, they're small as a dot. Yes, there are, there are angels working for Allah, but they're so smart. You could be in a room and millions of angels could be around you. That's the beauty of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali alayhi salam further describes these angels. They have duties. Allah has entrusted all angels to carry out particular tasks in the universe. And then the Imam says all of them are in the state of worship. They enjoy worshiping Allah. They are never fatigued. They never sleep. They never get tired because they're positive, pure energy connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Imam says some of them are perpetually in the state of ruku. Some of them are eternally in the state of sujood. Some of them are standing on their feet, not moving like ready soldiers worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the most beautiful tasks that the angels do is they pray for the believers. My dear brothers and sisters, if sometime you feel down, you feel depressed, you feel lonely, you feel like society doesn't understand you, realize that the best of Allah's creations from the angels who surround his throne, they pray for you. Read Surah Ghafir. This is from the Quran. Surah Ghafir, verse 7. What does Allah say in Surah Ghafir, verse 7? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-ladheena yahmiluna al-arsha wa man hawlahu yusabbihuna bihamdi rabbihim wa yu'minuna bihi. In verse 7, Allah states those who carry the throne of Allah and the throne of God is symbolically the throne of God. Allah doesn't have a physical throne to sit on because he's not a physical being. The throne of God is the center of the universe, the command center of the universe, the set calm of the universe. They carry the throne of God. They carry the knowledge of God. And those around the throne, they glorify Allah. They believe in Allah. What else do they do? According to the Quran, they do istighfar for the believers. Oh Allah, you have included everything in your rahmah and mercy. Oh Allah, forgive those who have repented, those who go back to you, those who follow your path. Oh Allah, protect them from the fire of hell. The purest angels they look down at you on earth and they pray for you. Oh Allah, take them to the paradise of heaven that you promised them. They don't just pray for you. They pray for your parents, for your spouse, for your children. Beautiful dua in Surah Ghafir, my dear brothers and sisters. So the angels surround us. Haven't you heard we have two angels, right? That is the metaphysical world. This is a type of the paranormal dimension in our lives. Each one of you, you have two angels, one to your right, one to your left. Everything they do, you do, you, they record them. They're with you. There are two angels who never leave you. Now in this dunya, most people... There is a veil that blocks them from seeing the angels. The prophets and the imams, they could see the angels. And the very high-ranking believers have access to see the angels. But most people, Allah has not allowed them to see the angels. Because number one, they're not pure enough to see the angels. They're not qualified. Secondly, Allah is trying them. Allah wants to test us. The moment we die, فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ As Allah states in Surah Qaf, the moment you die, Allah removes the veil and you begin to see everything. At the moment of death, we see the angels. As for the believers, this, is, this will be their experience with the angels. In Surah An-Nahr, verse 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, الَّذِينَ تَتَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Those whose lives, whose, whose souls are taken by the angels, طيبين. they were good believers. What will the angels say to them? يَقُولُونَ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah, imagine that moment. You're leaving dunya, you're anxious, you're scared. The angels of God comfort you. They say, سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Peace be upon you. أُدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Go into heaven because of your good deeds. Isn't that beautiful? 
But unfortunately, to the contrary, what about the unbelievers, the evil ones? In Surah An-Nisa, verse 97, Allah describes how they will meet the angels. There are some people, when the angels meet them, the angels meet those people while they are oppressors. They've committed injustice against themselves, against others. They will give them the news that punishment is awaiting you because you never cared for justice, for Allah, for humanity. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is a very important dimension in our lives. We are surrounded by angels and they are witnesses on the day of judgment. They will testify next time you're alone in a room and shaitan tempts you to commit certain sins. Remember, there are angels who are going to witness. Am I aware of that? Do I care about that? Respect the presence of these angels. In one very beautiful hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa states, you should have haya, you should feel ashamed of the angels who are recording your deeds. Just like you'd be ashamed if two good people were in your presence. If you have a good neighbor and your, your neighbor is with you day and night, would you commit some of those sins? The Prophet says, have respect for those angels. They're with you. They're witnessing. And so this is an amazing dimension that we have, my dear brothers and sisters. We believe in the presence of angels. They are spiritual beings made from the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we also have another type of spiritual being that's not just, you know, physical matter that we recognize it's also unseen to us and that is the creation of the jinn we all believe in the jinn just allah as allah has created the human being from clay allah has created the jinn from fire shaitan iblis he's from the jinn there are good jinn and there are bad jinn there are believers amongst the jinn who follow the holy quran read surah al-jinn in the holy quran there are believers and allah will reward them for that. And then there are the evil jinns. The evil jinns, we call them shayateen, shaitans. Shaitan is an evil jinn. Now, is it possible to see the jinn in physical form? For some people, yes. This famously happened at the time of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Once Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam was sitting on the mimbar, on the pulpit of Kufa, when a huge python Snake came and entered. So people wanted to kill the python as it entered through one of the doors of the masjid. The Imam Ali Salam stated, no, do not kill this python. I prohibit you from doing that. People were puzzled. What's going on? They saw this python approaching Ali ibn Abi Talib Ali Salam, and the python said salam to Imam Ali. This is in our authentic hadiths, my dear brothers and sisters. Then the Imam السلام, pointed to the python and said to the python, basically signaled to the python, wait, let me finish my sermon because the Imam was giving a sermon. So the, the python patiently waited. The Imam السلام, finished his sermon. Then the Imam السلام, had a conversation with that python. The python said to Imam Ali, I'm a jinn. I come from the jinn. And there is a situation I need your opinion on. The Imam Ali Salam gave him the solution, and the Imam Ali Salam says, I command you and the believers of the jinn to be pious, to follow the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, today, if you go to Masjid al Kufa, there is a door called Babu Thu'ban, the door of the python. That is the door from which that python came. People asked Imam Ali alayhi salam, what was that python? Who are you speaking to? The Imam says, this is the jinn. But because the jinn now wanted to communicate with me, they had to take a form. So they, take, they took the form of a python. The jinn do exist, my dear brothers and sisters. They actually do exist. And sometimes there is some interference. Some people, they might be exposed to some negative interference of the jinn. There is one hadith from Imam al-Rada alayhi salam in which um, Hakima, the, 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 uh, the sister of Imam al-Rada alayhi salam, she says, once I saw my brother Imam al-Rada alayhi salam, he was standing um, by a door 
And he was speaking to someone privately, but I didn't see anyone. So I told him, who are you speaking to? To Oh, my master. Oh, Imam Rada. And Imam Rada said, I'm speaking to a jinni. He is consulting me about something because the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are God's proof, not just on humans, also on the jinn. Lady Hakim salam, says, I want to hear his voice. Can I hear him? The Imam says, I don't recommend it. If you hear his voice, you will become sick and will have a fever for a whole year. <laughs> now, she was just so curious. She actually um, insisted. She's like, please, I really want to hear his voice. So he says, okay, well, I give you permission to hear him. So she heard his voice. She says it, it sounded like whistling. It was a very distinct, disturbing type of whistling. After I heard his voice for a whole year, I had a fever. Subhanallah. She had a fever for an entire year because the jinn have certain types of energy. Maybe some human beings or most human beings, they're not ready to be exposed to that energy. Now, historically, the jinn, they had a lot of interaction with the human beings. And they would give news to um, sorcerers. They would give news to seers. You've heard of seers, right? Where did they get some of their unseen information from the jinn? The Quran tells us that the jinn used to go close to the heavens where the angels would be discussing unseen matters and they would eavesdrop on them. They would try to spy on the angels. When Allah sent the Holy Quran, there was a new law. No jinn can come to the angels and hear and eavesdrop on them. The Quran says, this is the Holy Quran, that when the jinn tried to get close to the angels, a fireball, a meteor would strike them so they could not come near the angels. Imam Ali السلام, says one of the benefits of meteors in the universe is to scatter away the jinn from the angels so they don't eavesdrop on them. Historically, the jinn would eavesdrop on the angels. They would get some information. They would give it to the seers and the seers would misguide the people. They would say, look, we have the knowledge of the unseen. And they did have some knowledge of the unseen. But after Islam, this changed. Allah blocked the jinns from going to the angels. But the jinns have some other ways sometimes to know some unseen aspects. But after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the, the jinn were a lot more restricted. They no longer had the freedom to interact with human beings and cause interference like they did before the religion of Islam. So the jinn is also part of that paranormal dimension that we have in our lives. So we have the soul, our spirits. We have the angels. We have the jinn. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, what about telekinesis or psychokinesis, right? This is something that we hear about. There are so many reports of people controlling objects by focusing on them. Is it possible to focus like your mental energy on something and cause movements in the universe? What is Islam's take on that? We know the jinn, they have their own dimensions and their own powers. We know the angels, they have their own powers. What about our human spirit? Does our spirit have that effect? I would like to share with you an interesting incident that happened with Al-Imam As-Sadiq At the time of Al-Imam As-Sadiq a man appeared to know the knowledge of the unseen. So he would gather, you know, with the people. He was non-Muslim. He came to Medina. He gathered with Muslims. And he told them, ask me about anything. I have all the knowledge. So one person asked him, okay, what did I do last night? He told him. How much food have I stored in the house? He told him. He had knowledge to the unseen, according to this report. So the Muslims were shocked. And their faith was weakened. This is a non-Muslim and he has all that knowledge, then maybe he's on the right path. There was mass confusion. So they came to Imam Sadiq salam. They told him, Ya Rasulullah, save us. Muslims are doubting their religion because they see this non-Muslim who has this knowledge of the unseen. What do we do? The Imam says, bring him to me. Let me have a conversation with him. The Imam salam comes to him. He comes to the Imam salam. The Imam has a meeting with him. The Imam salam says, you have knowledge of the unseen? He's like, yes. 
The Imam says, okay, I'm going to do something. Tell me what's in my hand. The report says the Imam السلام, extended his hand into the wall and he grabbed something and the Imam told him, tell me what's in my hand. The man was shocked. He told him, look, you did something supernatural. I don't have access to. I don't know what you did. But here's what I will tell you. One second before you extended your hand, I took a look at the entire planet. But the second your hand was in the wall, you did something I couldn't see. You blocked me from seeing what happened in, on planet Earth. But then one second after you took back your hand from the wall, I also you know, took a screenshot in my mind of the entire planet. So one second before you put your hand and one second after I saw it, I saw one thing changed on earth. The Imam says, what is that? He said in one of the jungles of India, on a tree, one second before you put your hand, there was a bird, there was a, an egg in a bird nest. After you put your, you released your hand from the wall, that egg is gone. That's the only thing I saw changed on earth in that split second. The imam opened his hand and it was the egg of a bird. The man began to shake. He says, you have powers greater than me. I was able to see around earth. I have that type of knowledge. But you, you were able to bring that, 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 you know, that egg all the way from India. How did you do that? Now, my dear brothers and sisters, for those of you who are shocked, you know, about what I'm saying, just read Surah An-Naml. قَالَ الَّذِي عِنْدَهُ عِلْمٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ In Surah An-Naml, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that the one who had some knowledge of the book, and he was the successor of Prophet Sulaiman, he teleported the Arsh of Bilqis, the throne of Sheba, the huge throne that men couldn't carry, all the way from Yemen to Palestine, over a thousand kilometers or miles. This is Quran. This is Quran. Why he had some knowledge of the book? The Ahlul Bayt have the full knowledge of the book because the Prophet said, My Ahlul Bayt and the Quran are tied together. They shall never separate. And Allah has put all the knowledge in the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt have access to that. So don't be surprised if the Imam can do that. Don't say, Oh, no, these are exaggerations. No, why not? The Quran says the successor of Sulaiman was able to do that. Imam al-Sadiq is the successor of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He's greater than Asif ibn Barqiyah, the successor of Sulaiman. So he retreated, he took back his hand and he showed him that egg. He told him, I'm shocked. How did you do that? The Imam says, I invite you to become a Muslim. The man was struggling. He says, no, he was too arrogant. I don't want to follow. Who's this Muhammad? The imam told him, didn't you see the powers I have? This is a drop from one, what my grandfather has. Be a Muslim. He, he kept refusing. The imam told him, okay, let me ask you a question. How did you get the knowledge that you have? The knowledge of the unseen. How did you get it? He said, for 50 years, I opposed my desire. For 50 years, anything I crave, I say no. Anything I desire, I say no. For 50 years, I opposed my desires, and that's how I got this power of the unseen. The Imam السلام, told him, okay, let me ask you a question. Do you desire to become a Muslim? He said, no, 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 not at all. The Imam says, okay, challenge your desire. Don't you say for 50 years I've been opposing my desire? You don't desire to be a Muslim? Yalla, go against this desire and become a Muslim. <laughs> the Imam السلام, just cornered him. He thought for a moment and then he saw the imam had that ability to bring that egg. He's like, okay, you know, you seem like to have powers greater than me, so I will submit. Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. After he became Muslim, the imam put his hand in his pocket and he took something simple. Like, let's say, a prayer bead, something simple, like a ring. He told him, now tell me what's in my hand. He focused for a moment. He told the imam, I lost all those powers. What did you do to me? I can't see what's in your hand right now. SubhanAllah, moments ago, he was able to see the jungles of India. And if something is missing from a bird nest, 
But now he didn't have the ability to see what's in the imam's hand and he took something simple from his pocket. The imam said, yes, let me tell you something. For 50 years when you opposed your desires, Allah loved the act of opposing your desires. Allah loves that act. But because you were a kafir, but because you were not a Muslim, you don't believe in the akhirah, Allah rewarded you in dunya for that. And he rewarded you by giving you that knowledge. Now that you're a Muslim, you have the akhirah, Allah wants to compensate you for opposing your desires on the day of judgment. So he took away that knowledge that you have in dunya because he wants to save for you a better reward on the day of judgment. So my dear brothers and sisters, there is some basis to telekinesis or psychokinesis. Now, how does it work? One theory that scholars have is that your soul has power. Your soul has energy, just like a magnet has physical energy. The soul of the human being is more powerful than the body. If you learn how to access dimensions of the soul, you can move objects. That can happen for some people. Some people do certain mental and spiritual exercises, even if they're not Muslim. They can actually generate energy around them to impact objects. This is not impossible. This is one theory. The other theory is that this is done through the help of the jinn. There are some people, they are connected with the jinn. And when they engage in telekinesis or psychokinesis, it's actually the jinns moving around objects or causing that energy. But you are the one who's dictating to the jinn what to do. Now, many scholars say this is haram to do. You know, for you to go and control jinn, and to you know have them do certain work, you're not authorized by Allah to do that. Prophet Sulaiman, he was authorized. Prophet Sulaiman, he would command the jinn, even the shayateen, according to the Quran, he commanded them to do certain labor and work. But that's a prophet of Allah. If you're not a prophet of Allah and Allah is not authorizing you, it's haram to go and learn these practices. This is the opinion of, of some scholars. So that could be one aspect of it. Another dimension of that is witchcraft, black magic, witchcraft. Many scholars believe the way that black, black magic or witchcraft works is basically by working with the jinn and the jinn, they put that spell. They are the ones who generate those negative effects. This, this is a type of negative evil telekinesis where you're connected with jinn and they do that for you. And sometimes it's by controlling souls. In Arabic, we call this istihbar al-arwah. I've heard from trustworthy scholars where they've attended sessions and they've seen it themselves. Someone has passed away. Certain people, they gather, they, they do certain procedures and they summon the soul of the dead. And they speak to the dead. And he gives them information about his life and you know things that only he would know. Now, again, our maraja say this is haram. Because you're disturbing the soul. You're not authorized by Allah to do these acts. Allah will hold you accountable. This is a type of sin because you're disturbing the soul. The soul and the barzakh, they have their program. Don't disturb them by summoning them. Now, Allah allows you to do that for some to test them, of course. It's a test. Just like you can hurt your neighbor, right? It's a test. We have to be also responsible. But there is some basis to that, my dear brothers and sisters. So it's either the power of the soul that generates some energy, or it's some type of collaboration with the jinn, or it's a type of witchcraft that some people do. This is rare. Most people don't have access to this. Most people probably exaggerate or they make false claims. But does it exist? Yes. Many of our scholars believe to an extent it does exist. And there are some people who know and they've mastered the procedure in achieving that and in doing that. So the Islamic perspective is those people who are believers and they are on the path of Allah and they have knowledge of the book. Allah gives them that knowledge. Allah gives them these paranormal capacities because it's in Allah's obedience. Imam Ali salam, in one night, according to all the companions, he went from Medina to Madain, that's over a thousand kilometers, in order to wash Salman al-Muhammadi when he passed away in Madain, modern-day Iraq. 
And one night, the Imam alayhi salam did that. Allah gave him that power because the Imam alayhi salam is a servant of Allah. And he knows the name of Allah. And he uses such powers in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to be trusted by God to have such powers. Allah doesn't give this to anyone. So those who are true believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them some access into that. He does open for them a window. But then there are some people who follow shaitan. Shaitan has also some powers that Allah has given him. Through some satanic methods, they might engage in some paranormal activities. But you don't have to be concerned. There are ways to protect ourselves. My dear brothers and sisters, write Ayatul Kursi in your house. Post it in every room. This is in our hadith. This protects you from the interference of jinn. Every morning, recite Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas. In the afternoon, recite it. At night, recite it. This gives you protection. Some people are you know, paranoid about all of this. You have a Lord. He's managing the entire universe. No need to be paranoid. It's okay. Allah is in charge. He will give you that protection, but you have to seek that protect, protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my dear brothers and sisters, I know this has a lot more dimensions and a lot of details. And I'm just not sure, you know, how uh, each member in our audience is going to react to this. So I will just leave it at that. We will, let, we will now open the floor to answering any specific questions that you have, you know, about this or any uh, related topic. So now, inshallah, we'll start the Q&A session with as salat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Thank you, Sayyid. I will not lie. This lecture has shocked me in many ways because uh, I didn't know much of the information shared. And also, it just shows, it goes to show how limited our minds are and how truly there is an entire universe and more within all of us and uh, outside. So we have quite a few questions. I think I'll start with um, one of the first stories that you mentioned. Uh, did the snake only pass because there was an imam there? Uh, uh, because in most of the stories, the jinn only appears when the imam are present. How do you know, for example, a snake passing by is a jinn? That's a very good question. For us average human beings, we don't know. We might see, for instance, a snake, right? Usually the hadith states, usually they take that form. Usually, not always, usually. So we might see a python, a snake. It could be a jinn. And most likely it's not a jinn, but we don't know. For the average person, they don't know. Those who are connected to Allah, like the imams of Ahlul Bayt, and the very righteous ones, the very high-ranking believers, Allah gives them that insight. Because Allah gives them vision to see around them. You know, Allah gives them divine goggles to understand life around them and, and to see these different dimensions. So for, for the average person, it's not possible to know. Two people can know. One, those who are righteous like the imams and those who may be working with shaitan. And so the jinn might inform them and might give them a signal. That is also theoretically possible. But for us, there is no way that we can know. If we can control the jinn, does that mean that they fear humans in general? Yes. You know, subhanAllah, if you go to Surah Al-Jinn, I would like to read for you this verse in Surah Al-Jinn, which shows you that the human being is potentially more powerful than the jinn. So, in, in verse 5, and لن تقول الإنس والجن على الله كذبا وأنه كان رجال من الإنس يعوذون برجال من الجن فزادوهم رهقا The jinn are basically surprised. They're saying there are some ins, humans. They would resort to the jinn, seek refuge in the jinn, but the jinn made them more miserable. And basically the surprise of the jinn, according to one tafsir, is that you humans, you're a greater creation of God. Why are you resorting to us? You think we're more powerful? No, you're more powerful. Iblis is not more powerful. God has given Iblis powers to test us, sure. 
but the human being with his soul and spirit and his connection with Allah, he can be greater than the jinn. So why are you coming us and asking us for help? We should come to you humans and ask you for help. And indeed the jinns, they would come to the prophets and the imams and they would ask them for help. They would recognize them as the best of Allah's creation and creations that had more power. Even the angels were shocked at Adam. Adam al -asma when Allah gave Adam all the names, all the knowledge, the angels were shocked. They're like, you have knowledge we don't even have access to. Wow. This, the human being is just God's greatest creation. So there are historically jinns who tried to seek the help of, of humans, but then the miserable humans or the humans who are on the wrong path, they go after the jinn and they ask them to do things. But yes, the jinns can control. Uh, the, the, the ins, the humans can control the jinn. This is called taskhir al-jinn. If you want to research this, it's called taskhir al-jinn, where some humans have the capacity to, co to, to control the jinn. But as, I, but as I said, many scholars say it's haram. Doing that, it's haram because it leads you to negative routes, and sometimes it gives you the power to hurt other people. You know, through witchcraft, through black magic, that's how it's done. It's evil human beings connected to the jinn. Thank you, Said. Before I go to all the questions about the energy, let me just ask a question here. Who is the tribe of Satan? And is it true that he is the leader of the evil jinn? Okay, so basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Satan from fire. Min marajin min nar. And Satan is not the first jinn. He is a descendant of other jinns. But he is the first jinn to become so evil and to become so arrogant. So there are different tribes of jinns. There are different families of jinn. Iblis is the leader of the shayateen and the evil jinns who whisper to, to, the, to the human being. He is the father of them. And he has children, by the way. And the hadith says all of his children are males. He doesn't have female children. I don't know, maybe males are more evil than females. Allahu alam. Yalla, that's good for those uh, feminists who <laughs> always, uh, you know, criticize uh, male, male chauvinism, right? The hadith says that the children of Iblis are just male. And so he has a lot of children, grandchildren. He has an army of children working with him. So the evil jinns, many of them are shayateen, and they do work for Satan. Satan, he is the leader of the modern day evil jinns who whisper to the human beings. But there are other families and tribes of jinns. Thank you, Sayyid. Um, we have questions here. How do we fight off negative energy? As you said, uh, lots of dua, Quran, believing in God, knowing that he has made all of this. And then another question is, is that positive energy that God gives good believers, the same energy and blessings given to those who can see Imam Mahdi? Peace be upon him. How do you fight off negative energy? One way to fight off negative energy is wudu. My dear brothers and sisters, as you interact with different people and different objects and different circumstances throughout the day, the most areas of your body that attract energy are the face, the hands, and the feet. These are the areas that get exposed to maximum energy. And a lot of that energy is negative. There are scholars who have analyzed the beautiful effects of wudu. One effect of wudu is that it washes away all the negative energy on your body and it replaces it with pure energy. That's why the water that you have to use for wudu must be fresh water, right? Meaning plain, fresh water, tahir, pure water, not water that is stolen. It has to be, you know, lawful to you and all the conditions that you've learned in fit, right? That purity, Allah has put positive energy in water in order to remove that negative energy. So doing wudu multiple times a day protects you from negative energy. That's why it's mustahab even outside of salah to do wudu. You know, al wudu ala al wudu inurun ala nur. Doing wudu after wudu is light upon light. It actually repels a lot of that negative energy and it attracts a lot of positive energy. So I recommend that you do wudu ghusl. That also gives you positive energy. This is a great way to remove the negative energy. That's why it's also highly mustahab. Before you sleep, 
sleep on wudu, have wudu. That protects you till the morning from any interference, from any negative energy. So that's one recommendation that I have, my dear brothers and sisters. As you also stated, salah, salah, dua, that brings positive energy. Having animals at home brings positive energy, such as pigeons. The hadith states have animals in the house. I know these days, you know, in some apartments, some smaller houses, it's very difficult to do that. But it's mustahab. It's mustahab to have pigeons in your house. If you have a backyard, to have, Islamically speaking, to either have a goat, to have a rooster and a chicken, that is highly mustahab. That brings in positive energy to the house. And the hadith states, if the jinn want to interfere with you in the house, when you have pigeons, when you have animals, the animals attract the jinn and the jinn becomes busy with the animals and they're distracted from you. That's one benefit of having animals in the house. Now, there are animals who bring negative energy, like the dog. Having a dog in your room, not a dog like who's... Uh, uh, protecting your house outside. That's okay Islamically. But bringing a dog into your own bedroom and your living room, it's makru. It actually repels the angels. That creates negative energy. And I know today it's the opposite. Everywhere in the world, you see the main pet has become a dog. And, you know, th there are consequences for that. We're not saying that the dog is a bad animal. The dog is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have a problem with the dog. But it just have a, it has a type of energy around it that we need to be aware of. Being too intimate with the dog is not healthy, spiritually speaking. Wine, alcohol, that draws negative energy. The chess board, chess, that board itself draws negative energy. That's why we even hadith that tell us don't even look at the chess board. Because that is somehow uh, the source of negative energy. Having a sheep slaughtered and given to the poor, that generates positive energy. Having vinegar in the house, on the table, that gives positive energy. Smoking harmal in the house, you know, the peganum seed, the harmal seed, that brings positive energy in the house. Salat al -layl, the recitation of the Quran, and the adhan loudly. The hadith states when you recite the adhan loudly in the house, that actually repels the jinn. And it brings a lot of positive energy to your house. So these are ways to get positive energy. Wearing the, the hirs or the hijab of the imams, where it's a collection of verses from the Quran and hadith and duas, and you wear it on your upper right arm for maximum protection, that also generates positive energy around you. Thank you, Said. In the uh, comment section, we have a lot of questions about cats. Are cats good? It's okay to have cats in the house. They don't bring negative energy. In fact, sometimes they would go, you know, and pass by the prophet's house. Sometimes the prophet would pet the cat. Um, that is completely okay. We don't have anything in the hadith that states it brings negative energy. So it's okay to have a cat. It's not makru. It's not unrecommended. However, with two conditions. Number one, um, the, the feces of a cat and the urine of a cat is nedges. So you just may, need to make sure that they're well potty trained and they don't make the house nudges for you because at the time of salah, you want your clothes and the prayer rug to be pure. The second condition, while you're praying not to have cat hair on you, remove all cat hair before praying. If you feel you can observe these conditions, it's okay to have a cat in the house. There's no objection to that. But are there animals that are more recommended? Yes, like doves, pigeons, that is more recommended. Thank you, Sayyid. Our next question is, those living in the barzakh, can they interact with this world? In a very limited fashion, yes. For most people in the barzakh, Allah has not allowed them to interact with people in this dunya. For some people, Allah has given permission. Some believers, sometimes they need to communicate a message to their loved ones. They need to send them a message. We need your deeds. Or sometimes they send specific messages to solve a problem. It's not unheard of. I've heard from some trusted scholars where this has happened. So yes, it is possible for those in the barzakh to interact with people in this dunya in a very limited basis. For most people, that's not the case. For some people, Allah has given them permission. And by the way, the, the Sahih Hadith tells us that our loved ones who pass away, they visit us at least once a week. Depending on your iman, 
If you have, if you're a mu'min, but you're on the lower rank, you're allowed to visit your family once a week. If you have more iman, you're allowed to visit twice a week. And those with higher, higher iman, three times a week. Now, those who visit once a week, it's on a Friday at noon. Every Friday at noon, the believers who have passed away, Allah gives them permission from barzakh to come and to visit you. So remember them in those moments. Thank you, Sayyid. Uh, our next question is, uh, let's see, let's do something not related necessarily to paranormal very quickly. What are some books we can read on the teachings of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam that we can possibly apply in our modern medicine today? One, one book that I recommend that really gives you um, good insight on the life of an Imam al-Sadiq in general, is if you go to alislam.org, there's, there's a series on the Imams by Sheikh Baqir Sharif al-Qurashi, and they're translated into English. I recommend you read that volume on Imam al-Sadiq You will learn many beautiful uh, teachings from the life of Imam al-Sadiq Now, specifically in the area of medicine, there is a book called Tibb al it has been translated. You can find it online. This has a collection of the medical recommendations by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, most of them coming from Al Imam Al Sadiq. So, those who really have an interest in the medical field, I recommend that you study these texts and see how you can understand them based on your knowledge of modern medicine. There are many, you know, amazing, fascinating teachings. So, Tib. The medicine of the imams. It's translated into English. You can find it online. Thank you, Sayyid. Our next, there are quite a few questions uh, repeated. So I'm just going to ask them to you because maybe, you know, it, it is important. Is the saliva of a cat nijis? Um, are parrots good? Uh, and then you already said that birds are preferred over cats. So that was that the saliva of a cat is pure. So don't worry about the saliva of the cat. If, they cat. if the cat licks you, licks anything, it's pure. It's the dog's saliva that is nudges. But a cat's saliva is completely pure. So no need to worry about that. About that. It does not make you nudges. Now, um, in, the, in the family of birds, the most preferred is, as I said, pigeons. Highly mustahab. We have many hadiths about that. Specifically, those pigeons whose feet are feathered, I don't know what you call them in, in uh, English. In Arabic, we call them rawa'ib. Basically, they are pigeons. You see the feet is also covered in feathers, right? You can't even see their feet. That is the most recommended animal to have in the house. Other families of birds, it's, it's okay. It's, it's, it would still be recommended, yes. But if you want the maximum recommendation, it is the pigeons. I think the sales of pigeons will be going up after this lecture. <laughs> By the way, I do know that in some cities, there are restrictions. Um, I know in some cities, you need a special permit to bring pigeons to your house. I don't exactly know why the, the claim is hygiene or whatever it is. So make sure you're also complying with the law. But generally speaking, it is the most mustahab um, animal to have in the house. Our next question is, in the marja of Sayyid Muhammad Hussein, does he say donating organs har is haram uh, or no when the body dies? So I guess this is the issue of like donating organs when somebody dies. My dear brothers and sisters, almost all the maraja, they say that donating the organ to save a life is not only, you know, permissible, but in some cases, it's even highly recommended. There is only a discussion on some of the conditions. For instance, if the person does not have a will to donate organs, do I have the right to go and donate their organs? That's where many marajah say, no, you cannot. If the person doesn't have a will, you can't use their, your, their body against their will. But let's say they do have a will. You know, they've signed up to be a donor or they have a will where that, that they authorize their um, organs to be donated. Most marajah say it's okay, but with conditions. The other condition, some marajah have said, if you have two recipients, one is a Muslim recipient and one is a non-Muslim recipient, if you can, if the medical system allows you, you have to prefer the Muslim recipient. 
No, it's not because we're discriminating against non-Muslims or they're any less human. But a Muslim believes in Allah and in the Quran. They're closer to you. They're your brothers. So you have to give them preference. So if you can do that, you are required Islamically to pursue that if you can. But I don't know if the modern medical system even allows you to decide who the recipient is. So that, that, that's a very important condition. Here's the most important one. And this is where maybe some maraja differ with others. Most of the times today in the hospitals, when, a do, when an organ is donated, it's when a person is, is pronounced brain dead. When you're pronounced brain dead, you still have a heartbeat possibly on a machine. Your, your, your organs are still functional. That's when the organ is donated. Most maraja today don't consider brain dead to be Islamically dead. Like Ayatollah Sistani, he doesn't believe that brain dead is fully dead. As long as you have a heartbeat, his understanding is you are to be treated alive. Yes, the brain is dead, but you know the soul may be still there. We don't know what's going on behind the veils. So in that case, if the person has a heartbeat and they're alive, if you take a vital organ like a heart, right? like a vital organ, such that when you take that organ, they're going to die. See, see, scholars like Sistani, they, they say that's haram. You're killing the person. So that's where you get different conditions. Now, those maraja who say brain dead is dead, yeah, they don't have a problem with that. If the person has been pronounced brain dead by the doctors, you can take the organs and, you know, you can donate them. So all maraja pretty much have allowed organ donation. They just differ on the conditions. What are the conditions? Can you donate a vital organ if you're brain dead but not fully dead? A lot say no, some say yes. So I just want our viewers to know that um, it's not the case that only some maraja have allowed organ donation. No, many maraja have allowed it. They, they might just have differences of opinion um, when it comes to the uh, conditions. All right, so we... Do you have one small question if we can answer? I know we're almost out of time, but uh, just very briefly, how can we obtain uh, a status where we can see Imam Mahdi alayhi one day? My dear brothers and sisters, don't make your priority to see Imam al-Mahdi. We're not obligated to do that. Make it a priority for Imam Mahdi to see your good actions. If Imam Mahdi sees your sincerity, you love him, you care about him, you love humanity, you do good in your society, he will somehow make you feel his presence. We don't have anything in our hadith that tells us for sure if you do this, you're going to see the imam. There are some, some, uh, some you know, acts that scholars have tried. For instance, going to Masjid al-Sahla in Najaf, going to Masjid al-Sahla, which is by Masjid al-Kufa, for 40 consecutive Tuesday nights. So if you go for 40 Tuesday nights, one after the other to Masjid al-Sahla, it has been reported that scholars have met the Imam there. But if you do good deeds, somehow the Imam will make you feel his presence. Make that, you know, the, the, the priority. So if you want to see Imam Mahdi, see him in good deeds. See him in the eyes of an orphan that you sponsor. See him and kids who don't have access to proper education and you make that available. See him when you're about to sin and you say no to your desire. Spiritually seeing Imam al-Mahdi is far more powerful. Thank you all my dear brothers and sisters. And I thank the organizers. Keep us in your du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to thank everyone for this beautiful interaction tonight. It was the most that we have ever had. And I know we couldn't answer some questions, but inshallah, in two weeks, we'll continue these wonderful lectures by Sayyid Qazwini. And we really thank you for your time, Sayyid.